All right, so, so I'm going to read a few, um, a few pages, okay? I randomly opened it, Theodora. <laughs> it landed on chapter eight, so that was fascinating. That's the, it's nine chapters long, so this is the chapter before, the very last. Um, let's see, where shall I start it? Okay, here we go. I felt Michael in my awareness, he was happy. He told me that he was going to go out to, to the, out of there because his family needed a change of scenery and type of food. Now, you haven't read the previous part, but um, Michael was um, decided to borrow uh, the body of a whale. <laughs> so he was hanging out in the ocean in a whale body. I said, your family? Yes, his family, he answered. And I saw family whales in my mind. Remembering his response, I remember the story of how Vishnu had incarnated as a pig. After a while, Vishnu forgot his divinity and thought he really was a pig, and that looking after his piglets was the most important thing in the world. Gods and Buddhas came to him and would whisper in his ears, you're not a pig, but he was happy and content and stayed as a pig until dying. At which point, he remembered he was not a pig, but a god. I said, you're not a pig, Michael. And he responded, of course I'm not a pig, I'm a whale. <laughs> I smiled and let it go. If gods could not convince Vishnu that he was a god and not a pig, I didn't have much of a chance convincing Michael he was not a whale, but an angel. Plus it felt really like he was pulling my leg. I felt a big wink come my way, I giggled. And he said, Inelia, you're not a pig. And I said, of course I'm not a pig, I'm human. <laughs> I knew we were joking and playing with a sense of who and what we are at, the t at any one time, but as I laughed at his response, it suddenly occurred to me that this conversation was very much related to the topic we had covered in the previous chapter. I got incarnated into the body of a pig and became convinced he was a pig, forgetting his divinity completely. We incarnate into physical reality and completely forget where we come from, what we are, and why we incarnated into physical reality. Most of us feel a sense that this is a willing participation in doing something here on this planet. Most of us feel a, a strong sense of mission, yet some feel it is a trick or a prison. Whenever I look at it, it feels to me that it is more of a willingness to be tricked into a mission. An eternal divine all-knowing being cannot be tricked unless it purposely chooses a lower level of awareness for a while. And why would it do that? Also, as I observed Michael in his new game, moving away from my awareness and from the area with his whale family, I sensed that there was a strong connection between enjoying the physical world and becoming addicted to it. I wondered if the physical reality was sentient and needed souls to keep it alive and, well, real. To stay alive, it offered experiences and things that were rich in sensory stimulation. Everything we feel at a physical level is not only felt here, it does not carry to... It does not sorry, everything we feel at a physical level is only felt here. It does not carry to the in-between life space or even to other realities we might encounter during out-of-the-body experiences. It also occurred to me that we spend a lot of time out of the body. We sleep. And if we don't sleep, things go bad for us very fast. My thoughts came full circle to the meaning and importance we give life. Without meaning and importance to their experience and existence, most people quickly die. I've seen it so many times as people work for decades at their job, they die a few days or weeks after they retire. Or when a couple are close, they die from natural causes within days or weeks of each other. It is almost as though the relationship between the body and the soul can only be kept if the soul, believe, the soul believes it has the purpose here and the belief that what it does or experiences is important. And what more important than personal evolution or the growth of, and survival of our families, tribes, or nations? Michael left my location and I wondered if he would become trapped in the whale body until that body died, or whether he would remove himself from it without losing perspective of, of what he truly was. I sensed that he had done this many times before, and as a multidimensional being, he could live and enjoy being a whale and also have the capacity to visit his followers and give them powerful and important missions to do on the planet at the same time. There was a knock at the door. It was Gabriel. Come in, it's open. Morning. Good morning. How come Michael has so many followers and people that do his missions while you don't? What? No cup of tea first? <laughs> of course, I'll put the kettle on. But seriously, I have met Michael's followers and channels, and they're intense and highly mission-driven. 
Plus, there are a lot of them all over the world. Did you know that Brussels, which is the seat of the European Union, and many organizations that are actively pushing for the old paradigm, is filled with statues and churches dedicated to Michael? Not all the followers are listening to Michael himself, he said. There are other energies and entities pretending to be him. And like we discussed before, because of his warrior energy and the fact that he reflects fear back to the people who carry it, he has been used as a symbol of wrath. I said, he has a huge following though, and you don't. There are those who do indeed channel you and follow you, but not to the same degree as they do Michael. Gabriel says, I guess people prefer to embody and follow his fire and protective energies than my more gentle and nurturing ones. Well, can you tell me how to discern, how our readers can discern what is really coming from you or Michael and what is another entity coming in pretending to be you? Well, all I can say about that is that whomever is coming through is irrelevant. Whether the message really comes in from Michael or myself or some other entity is not important. What you need to look at is what the message is saying, what it is conveying both in essence, energy and content. I said, I always distrust any message that use the words beloved, beloved, dear ones, or supreme creator, God, Jesus, or other religion specific words. Gabriel, well, there are two things to keep in mind when you hear those words. One is that although your personal experience was somewhat unique when meeting Michael, most people feel his deep love and universal spirit of passion and protection for all living beings. As his thoughts, feelings, and scenes come into the person who is channeling him, they get interpreted into the language the person speaks, as well as the cultural and religious programming that the person has. So, for example, the word beloved expresses his love for the people who are listening. Indeed, it's not a word here I would use, but it is the, senti the sentiment we feel. My advice would be, if you want to start reading people's channelings, and not just those who channel Michael or I, aim to be more open, to have the willingness to get to the core of the message rather than the dogma or agendas the person might be carrying at a subconscious level. But I do understand that it is a hard thing to do, to see a core energy or message when a person is telling you to go to your local church, give your power away, tell you to do as they say, or listen to what is being said because they know better than you, are all knowing or have the only true and real answers, or tells you that God is a man in heaven or is being or a being that created you. Yes, it's hard for me to read or listen to channelings these days, most seem to have had the type of any, that type of energy in them, the one that expects the listener to give their power away or ignore their own inner guidance. Sometimes they start right, and the information they channel for the first few years is really great. Then it goes sideways. Sometimes they have one powerful gem and then start talking absolute rubbish. And then I feel I can't share that gem because people will automatically assume I'm advising them to listen to the rubbish too. Yes, I have noticed that many people are willing and ready to be led, to give their power away and follow someone blindly, but that's not from a place of subservience, although many religions have steered it that way. It is from a place of innocence and willingness to learn and grow. It also has to do with a DNA sequence that was integrated into the human body to basically follow a leader, follow orders without questions. I said, and we go back to the same topic, like looping back to the same questions. Would Why would an eternal, divine, all-knowing being have the need to learn and grow, or even follow orders? And why do most people of a high frequency need to learn how to function and survive in negative and painful circumstances? Why do they fall for the lies that tell them that pain makes them better people when they arrive here, pure soul, intent, and energy? <laughs> 